All right. So I think we're recording. Looks like we are. Um, and then we are also advancing through slides. So um, just as a quick update, um, as is obvious, we're not there in person. So we're just doing this <laughs> as a real quick uh, interim. We're going to go through the first part of these slides. Um, if you hear one of three little boys in the background, that is background noise that you should just ignore. Um, but they're usually relatively quiet, which is just asking for chaos to erupt. Um, so anyway, what we're going to go through is we're going to go through dose response modeling. Um, any kind of questions or anything like that, make sure you put them in either a discussion board, email me, whatever, find me, however we're going to be doing that, or save them until Friday as well. We can have them as a discussion. What we're going to start with, though, is we're going to start with where dose response data come from, but also the rationale behind mechanistic dose response modeling. Why do we want to go about it? Why are those data different? How does that compare to other sources of similar types of data that we might be able to gather? Um, so here are our learning objectives. All of this is dose response, obviously. Um, what we're going to go through is we're going to go through all the mechanics this week. Um, on Friday, we'll go through the derivation of the dose response models, how the optimization occurs, what do we have to do after optimization. And then I'll allow us to lead into how we actually use this in risk characterization. There's going to be a lot of overlap between the next few weeks where we get into risk characterization, um, mainly because we're just going to kind of hammer through the method. We're going to go through a couple different examples and case studies. Um, and so um, if, you know, if we need to, we'll make sure that it becomes a much more of a discussion based as well for, or I, what we'll also do is <clears throat> try and make it more discussion based for your particular projects going forward. So here's what we're going forward. And the main thing to remember is what we're talking about is microbial dose response in particular here. Uh, chemical dose response <clears throat> has similar principles. Um, However, what ends up happening is the data have much more specific requirements and there are post um, experimental protocols you have to go through that are very particular to chemical dose response. I'll make those differentiations along the way where I, where I can. So we'll start with the <clears throat> um, microbial dose response side of things. This is not model derivation, sorry. I'll have to update those, slide, those uh, subheadings for the slides. Um, what we wanna do is we wanna first start talking about it from the standpoint of dose response. So these are supposed to be paused, but they're not. So we're fine. OK. So what we're talking about is we want to first understand what we're talking about by way of having a computational model. So all a computational, any mathematical model, all they do is they are a representation of the real world that is accurate and precise to specific bounds that we set um, and that we can make predictions from. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to say, this estimate is a good estimate for X, Y, or Z reasons under these particular conditions. And then from that, <clears throat> I can make specific predictions and then to either test the model or be able to use that to be able to make decisions or something moving forward. So the point of it is that what we want to be able to do in the, the holistic sense of the QMRA or the mechanistic risk model if we're doing it for chemical or radiological or a physical hazard is for us to be able to say, we know that there are a specific set of hazards or one specific hazard that you're going to be exposed to. From that, we can make an estimate of the likely health effect of which we want to intervene upon and then we can make decisions from. The other aspect of it on testing or, or making predictions using a model is to be able to try and say, under what other conditions does the risk change? Does the hazard change? Does the exposure change? What, what are these different conditions under which different dynamics will occur and alter our decision space, our overall system, or something like that? So when I've talked before about things like digital twins, it's basically just a, a fancy word for those kind of what if scenario uh, running that you can do. Because what you've done is you re recreated the population of Columbus or Philadelphia or wherever. And you can do these different events like a bioterror attack or a pandemic virus running through the city or a water distribution system failure or something along those lines um, to be able to see what would actually happen. What, what would you expect to happen that you can have pre-planning in place? So when we're talking about it from the standpoint of 
a health effect model, we can see that the, what we want to do is we want to get to a, some population level estimate if possible, or have it as an individual level estimate, depending on what the scenario is. So, you know, a handful of people working in a metal shop, you're going to have a suite of chemical and physical hazards that you need to be able to deal with. And you can stay at the individual level, especially if it's, you know, the milling machine specific or the drill press specific or something like that. Whereas if you're doing something for the water distribution system within a city, that's going to be population level. Dose response allows us to do either. We can look at it from the individual level and just stay at the individual level, or we can move on to the population level and then make those assessments from there. Um, and realistically, that's all it's doing is giving us an estimate of what that underlying relationship is between the dose that an organism is exposed our host is exposed to for a particular organism and then the likelihood of response. We have something similar for chemical and um, um, physical hazards and radiologicals. Um, the problem that we run into is scaling based on body weight that we don't have to worry about for microbial. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get into the, the specific data and the optimization components a little bit more. So a good way of thinking of things when we start, first start talking about computational models is what is the ideal model? And the ideal model is usually something like, you know, what's that linear curve? If everything was perfectly linear and it landed on that curve, what would it actually be? Or log linear or whatever the, the function would be. Let's say everything's log normally distributed. How would it actually fit within that distribution? Well, in this case, it's actually relatively straightforward because we know that we have some critical areas that are, um, oh, let me make sure that we actually are, yeah, we're still going, sorry. I wanna make sure the recording is still going. Um, we have certain critical areas at which we have some known acceptable risk. So one in 10,000 classic US EPA enteric pathogen risk for drinking water. That changes for recreational water, but let's say that we're doing this for, for drinking, for uh, piped drinking water. We've gone through this thought experiment before. If we wanted to have that perfect one-to-one -one relationship of that dose responses, because it is a possibility to do, we would need 10,000 animals, minimum. And in reality, when we have to take into account other things like, like uncertainty and variability within susceptibility within different populations, that's going to go up to about 50,000, 100,000, or maybe more. You're not going to get that through IACUC. You're not going to be able to actually manage that. Nobody's going to fund it. Um, and so the realities of it is that we are now pretty stuck in that, well, how do we try and get this um, dose response function and get as close as possible to a realistic estimate as, as we can? So because remember, a computational model is supposed to hold fidelity to the real world with as much accuracy and precision as possible that we can make uh, predictions from or estimations from or do a, some other action based upon it. So what we want to be able to do is we want to make sure that what we can account for is what this underlying dose response is without having to run these ridiculously high uh, animal studies or human studies or anything like that. So this is where we're going to talk about animal and human studies in particular. We're going to go through a couple of different classic examples of epidemiological studies that we can pull data from. Um, if you look at the research from Peter Tunis, um, formerly or maybe still is with Emory, um, and RIVM, he's done a lot of work. Um, what I'll do is I'll make sure to put a couple of those papers in as recommended reading um, for this week. There, it, it's kind of math heavy. He's not, he's not the best writer <laughs> um, for uh, broader uh, uh, dissemination of information. Um, and now I'm hoping he never sees this video because he's a good dude. Um, but uh, you can kind of go through and see what he does by way of trying to back calculate out those response from epidemiological studies. Um, and then what we can do is we can look at um, experimental studies, because those are really what we have lined up between what, where we can actually gather dose response data from. In the analytical epidemiology, we have the cohort and case control studies. We went through this in um, the Spray Park example on Friday, um, last Friday, when we were talking about where we actually started that project. You know, So initially, the project was started for us to be able to say whether or not the Spray Park had a significant impact on the likely number of cases. Um, 
And then from there, we wanted to move forward. Well, we built a case control study because it looked like we had enough data to be able to do that. And we could have backed out a dose response from there if we had you know, a better assessment of the exposed dose along the way um, or a better estimate of uh, contamination levels within the water or something like that. But we didn't. So we only used it to get to attack rate so that we can understand what the likely dose was based on the other underlying dose response function. But you can go the other way and we can talk about that. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And then there's the experimental where we have human and animal and no need to talk about that until we actually get to it, where you are actually just dosing people or animals with a particular organism or chemical or whatever. Huge caveat. I am an environmental engineer. I um, we am speaking to cohort studies that I've done in, in some level of practice, um, not uh, uh, from formal coursework. Uh, your mileage may vary, it's kind of that classic um, caveat there. Um, so when you're building out the cohort, you realistically have to understand first, what's the overall population? Um, you're not separating out based on their exposure or their health outcome just yet. Um, what you want to know is what you want to what you want to know is what is the population you are dealing with. So if we are building a cohort study within um, our project in Ethiopia, where we are looking at dairy and beef systems, the cohorts would be people who use dairy or to, or people who use beef, and then we can become more specific to that as we want to go around. We're not talking about contaminated this or contaminated that or um, people who have had salmonellosis within an you know, X number of years, not at that point yet, we're still just saying, do you use dairy, do you use beef? Then we can become more refined. Do you use ergo, which is kind of like a type of cheese? Do you use, or no, it's a, like a fermented yogurt stuff. Um, do you use quanta, which is kind of like beef jerky, um, uh, Ethiopian uh, traditional food? You know, uh, there are subsets of the population that either have that as a cultural practice or they don't, or they can't afford it or they can't afford it. And so now what you can do is you can start splitting up where your populations are based on the overall underlying system that you have. Um, then what you can do is you can define your exposures and or define your health outcomes and well, and your health outcomes. And then you can look at an association between the exposures and the health outcomes you're not really going beyond association. Um, you can take this a step further, put this in different <clears throat> environmental uh, components. And so you have an ecological model associated with your cohort study, and then you can separate based on urban populations that use ergo who have also had exposure to contaminated ergo that have a health outcome of salmonellosis or health outcome of shigatoxin associated E. coli or whatever else within that particular space. Um, you can do something similar where you have a population within a hospital, that population within a hospital, there's a subset who have some type of legionellosis, Legionnaire's disease or Pontiac fever. We really only track Legionnaire's disease. So let's say Legionnaire's disease. And you also have the logs of the water testing within the past month or within the past time frame that those people were within there. That's where you need to become much more specific about the time frames and uh, the the other, the other components of the overall study. But again, you're really still just at that association. You're not getting the type of data that's necessary for you to be able to say, this exposure led to these health outcomes, or these range of exposures led to these health outcomes, or these health outcomes can be um, predicted based on a, um, a specific range of, of concentrations or a specific range of positive test results, whatever. The values are. And this is where the definition of exposures becomes important. Um, if what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand an underlying dose response relationship, first of all, cohort des design is really just not good. Um, but um, if we don't have quantified uh, concentrations of whatever it is, then all we're doing is we're saying is that Legionella was in the water and then there were some health outcomes. And unfortunately, that's a lot of data that we collect in the environmental space um, because quantification is much, much more expensive. We've already gone through this when we talked about sensitivity specificities and the, um, uh, the hazard ID lectures. Um, but again, 
all we're doing in association at this point, not really taking it further than that. Um, if you're looking at it prospectively or retrospectively, it does actually end up mattering quite a bit. Um, what we end up being able to use, if we can use cohort, but usually case control, it's usually retrospective. If we can use that for dose response, what I'm trying to say. Um, so if we can use cohort, but it's usually case control and we can use them for dose response, it's usually retrospective data because we have the sampling logs and we have the um, people who have uh, uh, you know, recreated, drank the water there. And we also then have the, the health outcomes that come from it. So again, think to that Crypto Spray Park example, um, we had the number of people visit the spray park within a specific time frame. Um, we had their admission to the hospital or doctor's office with, you know, uh, uh, symptomology similar to what you would have for cryptosporidiosis. Most of all of them that were included were positive cryptos, uh, cryptosporidium tests in stool. Um, so we had very good specificity of information and data for which we were going to be able to do our case control study off of. And that allowed us to kind of bump that up to a case control as opposed to a cohort. The prospective side of things is um, where you're trying to look at it from the standpoint of if I put in these controls, what would end up happening? Um, so retrospective, you can do the same basic thing, but a prospective is more from a planning standpoint because you're trying to lead it, lead the uh, the data with um, either an intervention or an analysis or something else. Um, depending on your population, depending on what your system and what you're trying to do, you get pushed into either prospective or retrospective in general. Um, and then uh, you, you run it based on uh, each one of those. So we've seen something similar to this where we have it, where we could design a study out um, by saying the cohort is going to be school children who have visited um, a suspected park and a presumed day of exposure. So remember, at this point, remember where this differs from the specificity of the, the Cryptosporidium spray park example on Friday is, the, is actually the specificity of the time range with when they were going there, whether or not they were cases, confirmed cases or not confirmed cases, and whether or not we could actually say that they were actually exposed based on um, recall survey uh, results, recall survey or surveys where it was it still had all the bias associated with recall in them. And then we can say that if we can define a case within there, we can then move forward from there to be able to do further do further analyses. Um, so the, um, the cohort really tells us that there's an association there. It's kind of like using a linear regression to be able to say whether or not a variable actually matters in a data set. You don't want to use a linear model as an actual model. Really what you're doing is you're trying to say, does pH actually matter to Legionella concentration? But yeah, it does. How much does it matter? Gives you a better, it gives you a bit of an idea to be able to quantify how much does it matter kind of approach. So what are the associations between an exposure and an effect? They work out pretty well by way of a cohort. Moving it beyond that, you get a little bit fuzzier on, on being able to use it, especially for dose response. Um, rarely do you use a cohort study for dose response um, model extrapolation. Um, you can do it, but it's a lot more hazardous because you don't have the, the specificity of who was exposed and is not a case, who was exposed and is a case, um, and tr a good tracking of what those concentrations were associated with each one of those. Because that's that's the main thing. So you have a total number of people who um, are possible, or who, you have a total number of people who are exposed, and of those, there are positive responses and negative responses. And once you have those things, then you can go through, as we'll see when we get into the dose response optimization and uncertainty portion of the lecture on Friday, that's what you need to be able to actually do anything with dose response. Um, the other good thing, really good thing is again, kind of similar to doing exploratory statistics is to be able to say, do we have anybody who is especially sensitive to the hazard? Um, this is where we can get a better idea of things like, you know, children and elderly die from smallpox at a much faster rate. 
um, compared to the Yelp population. And then the flip ends up happening when you're talking about something like pandemic flu from the uh, teens, 19, 19 teens of um, it's the adult population who are dying at a faster rate, right? Same basic kind of thing. You can do those kind of associations <clears throat> by being able to say COVID-19 and obesity are not good bedfellows whatsoever. And, you know, same for diabetic populations and smokers and so on for other ones um, going forward. Um, as with the case control studies, we'll see is that there's um, confounding issues that always kind of raise their heads. Um, and realistically, these are population hungry approaches. Um, anything epidemiology is population hungry because your data is pinned to the number of cases, as we talked about all the way back from the, the very first lecture. So when we're talking about case control, we have a little bit more interest in this if we're going to try and back calculate or not back calculate, extrapolate out a dose response from these data um, and we still take the same basic steps we want to have an under i we need to know what or who our population is from there we need to have some evidence base that says we can define a case so in the crypto spray park <clears throat> it was somebody who um was ill where it was ill with cryptosporidiosis and had a positive stool sample. Um, so you wouldn't be in the hospital or in the doctor's office for us to be able to take a stool sample if you weren't actually symptomatic. If you're not symptomatic, then we don't put you in the ill category because you have no symptoms and so you don't have the associated illness. You could have the infection ongoing, but that's why when we back calculated out the attack rate, we made sure to account for the morbidity ratio at the same time. Um, yes. <laughs> and then, um, oh no, we, yeah, when we were back calculating out the dose, I'm sorry, uh, that, uh, that the population was likely exposed to, we made sure to account for the morbidity ratio. And we'll see that when we get into the derivation of dose response, why in particular for crypto, that's important, but also in general, that's usually an important thing to consider is that we're talking about infection usually when we're talking about dose response. Um, we also then want to be able to say that we have, you know, particular controls where people were exposed, but nothing actually happens. Because remember, you have a, a triad of things that you need to be concerned about. You need to have a total number of people who are exposed, positive responses, negative responses. A positive response is somebody who was exposed, but did not develop the illness or the infection. And then a negative, res or a negative response, correct us. Negative response is where somebody was exposed and did not develop the illness or the infection. The positive response is where somebody was exposed and did develop the illness or the infection. And so you have to have those three pieces for you to be able to do a dose response modeling or dose response analysis. Same thing basically for case control. This is why case control is usually better overlaying or extrapolating dose response functions or dose response data from if we're going to use these at all from epidemiological studies. So there are pros and cons to everything. Um, and we'll go through the pros and cons on experimental data as well. Um, the, the interesting thing is that when, if we're talking about something that's really a common ailment or a common condition, you typically need more and more people uh, for you to be able to do a case control study because you're more likely to run into cases than controls. Um, so if you're doing a case control study for the common cold or for the flu, you're going to need more people than if you're doing a case control study for um, swine flu or, you know, OG COVID-19. Um, you had much fewer cases of that in particular than you did for the um, common cold variant of coronavirus or um, something similar. Basically the same basic thing. If you're doing a model or if you're trying to do an assessment for pathogenic E. coli, you're going to need a ton of people involved because there are thousands of different types of E. coli that can give you a number of different types of infection. If you're talking about shiga toxin um, secreting E. coli, now that's something much more specific and you can, you're going to have to be more targeted with 
who it is that you're going to be pulling in. So your population is going to be lower. Um, you can look at different levels of exposure as well as multiple exposures. Um, this gets a little bit trickier in that you're, you're kind of internally confounding your own study in that how are you telling which exposure actually led to the infection or the illness? Um, so you could have been asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic, um, or something like that before your next exposure. So was it that next subsequent exposure that popped your dose high enough that now you have an infection or an illness? Or did you already have an infection and illness developing and then you just happen to get exposed again anyway? This was a really big question when we were looking at um, uh, uh, um, length of shift for healthcare workers and PPE selection for healthcare workers during COVID-19 um, and other, um, other types of events, um, where, you know, how do these kind of stacked exposures go with each other? And that's also a main question within dose response, mechanistic dose response in general, which is, there's usually a time, a temporality to the dose response that we don't always have a good way of locking in on. We have some models that do time post inoculation integrated into the models from those specific types of animal or human experiments. Um, and it's not clear if there's a temporal relationship relative to your immune response having an effect or if there's a temporal relationship based on just an aggregate level of exposure that you need to have in your body before you can actually have the infection. Similar to the example I was giving about the um, tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis living in your lungs for a long period of time until it either reaches a threshold or dose or concentration in your lungs at which pain it becomes tuberculosis, the actual disease, or your body becomes weakened enough that it can't hide anymore kind of approach. There's a real critical questions on what those multiple exposures and duration of exposure really mean. Um, the, the main things to consider when we're, we're thinking about the, the different designs is that when we're talking about dose response, and especially when we're talking about dose response in mechanistic risk modeling, we need to have causality. We need to have it go beyond association and be able to say, this exposure at this level resulted in this many infections or this probability of infection that led to this many infections, right? So this exposure at this level led to this probability of infection within this population and then this population, then would we can estimate would have this many overall infections. And this is a real critical separation between the exposure driven mechanistic risk modeling and um, transmission models within the, the more traditional public health space. Um, so we need to be able to show that there is an association, that there's a strength to that association. However, we need to also be able to show that there's a causal relationship and that that causal relationship can be quantified. Um, so realistically, what we need to make sure is that we are sticking within um, what the appropriate type of study that we want to try and be able to use. Now, when you try to back calculate out a dose response function or dose response parameters from cohort or case control studies, you have a couple you know, critical limitations and a lot of them come down to how the studies are established, what the studies are actually doing and the data that result from them. So, you know, because you have internal and overall study confounding, um, because you have um, uh, realistic limitations on the population size that you can recruit, and that there is a significant possibility that you have missed cases or missed infections along the way. If you're doing anything for infection, you're definitely missing people. If you're doing things for illness, there's a high prob probability that you're missing people, almost an assured assuredness that you're missing people still in that illness. If it's something really severe like Ebola, the likelihood of missing those illnesses is very, very low. 
relative to Omicron variant of COVID-19. You could have it right now and have almost no symptomology whatsoever, and it's very easy to be able to miss people within within those kind of categories. If you're talking about infection, you're missing tons of people, and that's what you're doing is constantly looking for seroconversion or things like that. Um, even then, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with it. So any of the analytical designs, because they are predicated on what's happening within the human population, there's a significant chance that you're going to miss uh, represent the overall exposure, the overall set of health outcomes, the likelihood of those health outcomes. And each one of those goes into, was the person exposed? Was it a positive or a negative response? And if you don't have those, you start falling apart on dose response, which is why in dose response, there's a relatively large group of us that vastly prefer experimental studies. Um, we call it the gold standard for us because <clears throat> what we're looking at is a much more controlled environment. I know that there are 10 people per dose group exposed. And I know within one of the dose groups, five got sick and five did not. And in another dose group, six got sick and four did not. And then the next highest dose group, seven got sick and three did not. And then on it goes until we run out of dose groups or however the, the dynamics kind of move around. Um, I have a much greater certainty of what those data are telling me. Now, there are still uncertainties associated with those data that we're gonna get into and we're gonna dive into pretty deep when we talk about the uh, bootstrapping of the dose response optimization. But for now, just in the development of the actual study, I have a lot more certainty in what's actually going on. Um, the, one of the bigger problems is that we don't always align with specific disease outcomes. So, you know, we could do a, a SARS-CoV-2 dose response on infection. It does not mean that it becomes the kind of classic symptomology of, um, double lung pneumonia. The technical term is evading me right now, um, where you get pneumonia in both of your, both your right, right and left lung. Um. You know, we, we don't have a really good way of being able to model out sequelae because usually you're in a much tighter time frame, especially if it's animal models, you're going to euthanize them um, by the end of it to be able to look at the, the pathology usually. Um, or something else is going to happen where you're not really going to be able to kind of follow that through. Also, a lot of times sequelae are, um, there are, there are uh, societal sequelae. So, you know, social stigma associated with surviving something. Um, there's, you know, then there's just kind of quality of life sequelae. So how do you tell whether or not a mouse is limping? How do you tell whether or not it's having trouble breathing? How do you have, you know, uh, you could do liver function tests and all those other kind of things, but there's a lot of things or a lot of types of sequelae that you really can't get a good at quantification of if it's an animal model. And then you rarely can run the study long enough to really be able to get the sequelae in human studies as well. So the really good thing, I think I already said everything that's on this slide, actually. Um, the really good thing, though, is that we can actually get down to mechanistic information. So we may not be able to get all the way down to a specific model about the actual mechanism of infection, but we can have a generalization of the mechanism of infection for really any pathogen to be able to describe what's going on. That what mecha mechanistic dose response actually is. Um, those are not Bradfield Hill criteria. I forgot to get rid of that title on that column. Sorry about that. Um, the really interesting thing when we're talking about experimental studies is that we can look at things like time dependency, host age dependency, diabetic status, um, multiple exposures, prolonged exposures. We have a lot more options because we have caged mice or guinea pigs or something like that, or we have human volunteers where we can give them specific doses over a period of time and see how, um, how the infection develops, whether or not infection does develop. We can track things like immune response. There's a lot of other components. We can look at how biomarkers are changing because there's a lot of other components that we can go through to have a greater deal of expansive specificity on how the infection is occurring and what processes are taking place. Um, 
Mm, that's not in the next slide. So sorry about that. I'll have to modify the slides as well. Um, and we can look at how susceptibility is changing. And again, not to have, don't de definitely don't want to make it seem like there's rose colored glasses when we're talking about experimental studies. Um, realistically, what we're usually limited to is um, IACUC or IRB ethics and realism. Um, the likelihood that people will actually volunteer if we're doing human volunteer studies. And in some of the older studies that were human volunteers, whether or not they were volunteers or volunteers. So, you know, there's, um, you know, even keeping away from the, the classic, like um, Tuskegee studies, not even going down that rabbit hole, you know, we cannot have anything using prison volunteers because they are in a coercive environment just in the fact that they are in a correctional institution. So, you know, we can't force all of them to be tested for COVID-19 because they are already in a coercive environment. Adding that next layer on top of it is a violation of their human rights. So human studies become much more specific on the ethical constraints. If we're talking about something that has really low likelihood of having prolonged health effects, a great example of this is norovirus. It's disgusting. It, it does hurt while you um, actually have the infection. The likelihood that you're going to die from it is very low, almost non-existent. Um, you could have really bad maintenance. Um, of your fluid intakes and lead to dehydration and then subsequent health effects from that. But if what you're doing is you're doing a controlled human study, you give people a dose of the norovirus and then you have consistent, con you know, you have consistent monitoring with them and that ensures that, you know, that's not going to happen. You also make sure that you have a highly capable host that you've chosen. So somebody that doesn't have an underlying health condition that could exacerbate the, the infection, which is a problem actually um, in and of itself, because in a lot of cases, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see what happens within a dynamic population. And part of that dynamic population is people who have increased susceptibility to a number of different hazards. Um, can't do that with humans. We can kind of do it with animals. Um, we can make mice diabetic. We can give them cancer. Uh, we basically have cured cancer. We can give them cancer and then cure them of cancer. Um, but, you know, we can take uh, mice and rats or other animals that have cancer and then dose them, we can make them diabetic and then dose them. Um, we can make them obese and then dose them. We can do all sorts of different things to be able to see what's happening within that host. And the good thing about microbial dose response is we don't have the body weight limitation that toxicological dose response does. Um, so we don't have to do a body weight adjustment. They'll become clearer when we get into the dose response derivation as well as the optimization, but we don't have to worry about that unlike toxicological dose response. Um, the only other things really are actually operating them. They're expensive and they are very um, uh, method, device and personnel specific on, on how to actually run them and, and, and to be able to run them overall. So this is where we're going to end on this lecture in particular. I have a couple of recommended readings for you to go through um, so we're prepared for um, hitting everything on Friday. There's a lot of options. Um, you, can, you can look at multiple different um, ways of generating dose response models, dose response parameters. You can re-derive dose response functions in a lot of different ways. Um, what it comes down to is what is it that you need the data to be able to do? What kind of story are you trying to tell? What kind of analysis are you trying to do? What kind of decision are you trying to inform? All of these things will start highlighting what are the better tests or what are the better studies to conceptualize and develop um, for you to be able to maximize your success in, in what you're trying to approach. When we're talking about it from the dose response data standpoint, I'm going to come back to the same thing I've been saying the whole time, which is you need a total number of people who are exposed, you need positive responses, and you need negative responses. You have those things, you can do a dose response optimization. The quality of the data is going to be what ends up impacting how well you can use it, whether or not you actually will get the optimization to work, and then how you're going to actually use those parameters later on. Um, the other piece to that is 
weight of evidence to be able to support other experimental or analytical studies to be able to improve our overall estimates or to make them work for other susceptible populations and so on from there. What we're going to do when we get into on Friday, we're going to talk about mechanistic dose response a little bit more. We'll talk, take a deeper dive into what the dose actually is, look at the derivation of the dose response models. What does that actually mean? Where do they come from? Their derivation you know, put certain limitations on them um, for their use. And then what do we do by way of actually optimizing these functions and then um, understanding the uncertainty of the parameters that we generate from the optimization. Um, sorry, I can't be there. Um, the announcement explains why, you know, just an update from an NSF panel because these things are always so much fun to begin with and why not add another day? Yay, so much fun. Um, much rather be there with you. Uh, but let me know if you have any questions. Save them until Friday if you want. Um, otherwise, have a great day. Bye. And now I need to stop.